Welcome to Holy Week. My name is Darian Tellez and I am so excited to be with you as we celebrate such a special week leading up to Easter weekend. We have a great weekend. So if you're tuning in today, be sure tune in tomorrow and the next day and the next day all the way leading up to Easter where we will be celebrating at all of our locations here online. Also at our location in Waikele, Mililani, Honolulu, Kailua, and in Metro Manila. So be sure if you are in any of those places, we would love for you to come and visit us in person because we have a great service in store for you. If you're interested in any of our service times or our online times, be sure to check out inspirechurch.live forward slash love. But this last week we have been in our series, Saints in the City, part four, wrapping up the series, talking about being planted in the city, more importantly, being planted in the house. And Pastor Lisa gave a powerful, powerful message this last weekend, talking in Matthew 13, the parable that Jesus spoke about, about a farmer who was tossing out seeds, and the seeds fell on different soils. And Jesus correlates these soils as heart conditions. So there was the footpath, it was a hard heart, and the bird, it ended up coming in, swooping, and eating the seed. And then there had the rocky soil where it maybe received the word for a moment, but there was rocks in the soil, so the roots never were able to grow deep, and it ended up dying. And then there was the thorny soil where it grew, but eventually the thorns and the weeds choked the life out of the plant. And then lastly, there was that good soil, which I hope we are all planted in good soil, being planted in the houses, being planted in good soil. Because in Matthew 13, it says that when we're planted in the soil, when we hear and understand God's word, it produces a harvest of 30, 60, or even a hundred times as much as had been planted. I know I would love to see a harvest 30, 60, or even 100 times more, and I'm sure you would as well. So man, let's be planted in the house, and, it's in, and at Inspire, we have three different chairs. We have the first chair, which is our new believer, our new Christian, and maybe you gave your life to the Lord this weekend, and man, congratulations on making the greatest decision of your life. And then we have our second chair, which is the growing Christian. So maybe they've received God and they're starting to get connected within the church. They've maybe joined our dream team. They've taken dream team 101. They've gone through our alpha course and they're growing in their faith. And then we have chair three, which is our mature Christian. They've been, they've been weathered. They have gone through trials. They've gone through hardships. And when we go through that, we know that our faith, is being built. So they've gone through it and then they've seen the faithfulness of God. And I love it because no matter what chair you are in, we need you all in church because without chair one, a new Christian, if church has never had a chair one, then eventually the church would die. But if we didn't have a chair three, then the church would stay at a shallow level because there's not the mature Christian who can help lead and help guide the ones and twos up into spiritual maturity. In Psalms 92 it says, but the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon, for they are transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God. So today what we're going to be talking about, what we're going to be diving a little bit deeper into is three takeaways for greater growth. Three takeaways for greater growth. So no matter what chair you're on, whether you're a new Christian or a mature Christian, we're always will be growing in our faith. There's never going to be a point where we have reached the pinnacle of Christianity. Like we hit level 10 and boom, we are a master chief Christian. No, because when we turn the corner, there will still be steps 11 through a hundred and then a hundred to a thousand and then a thousand to a million. So we all need to continue to grow, to continue to flourish because God wants to produce a harvest in your life that is 30, 60, or even a hundred times greater than what had been planted. So the first way for us to have greater growth is by staying hungry for the things of God instead of the things of the world. So stay hungry for the things of God. I have three little boys, a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and a one-year-old. 
And my one-year-old, I remember his growth and his development as he ate, right? When he's a baby, he craves his mother's milk. And then we started to introduce baby food and start, you know, you know, you know how we do it. You grab the, you scoop a little bit and you're like, here comes the plane. Ah, and you scoop it into their mouth. And then we started giving them these little, once, once he sort of progressed out of the baby food stage, we started giving them these little like baby like snacks that sort of just melts in their mouth when they put them in there. Uh, adults eat them sometimes. It's a little weird, but it, they, they don't taste awful, you know? And so he starts growing a hunger for, for solid foods as we slowly start introducing him to that. And, and now he's gotten to the point where he loves and he, and he craves solid food. He loves french fries, okay? Give... Cohen, a French fry, and my man is like going to town eating French fries because he's progressed. And, and as, he's, as he tastes new food, he starts to crave those new foods. And it's the same thing with godly things, is that as we start to consume them, we begin to get hungry and we begin to crave the things of God. This past month, I've been starting to get back into health and, and, and starting to lifting again and, and getting in the gym. And so I've been looking at a bunch of YouTube videos of different workouts and one of my least favorite exercises is a core exercise. Okay, I'll be doing like three to five crunches and my core is burning and I'm like, I tap out, I can't do it. But every ab video, every ab exercise video I see, they all say the same thing. They always say abs are made in the kitchen. And it's such an interesting perspective because it doesn't matter how much you work out your abs. If you're not feeding your body the right things, you will never achieve the results you desire. Right? So what if you, what, so, so what you consume is more important than how much you consume. Right? I could go out and have 2,000 calories of fast food. I could go to my favorite fast food place and get 2,000 calories. Or I could go and shop and cook 2,000 calories of lean protein and, and complex carbohydrates. And it's the same amount of calories, but they will each give me different results, right? The 2,000 calories of fast food, it'll leave me lethargic and looking a little flabby. But the 2,000 calories of lean protein and, and complex carbohydrates, this will energize me. It'll, it'll facilitate muscle growth in my body and it'll, it'll treat my physical body well. And the same thing goes for our spiritual health. In Romans 8, Paul writes that those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. So much like our bodies, when we hunger and we consume the things of God, right? When we are reading our word, when we are spending time in prayer, when we are fellowshipping with our fellow believers, our spirit grows and become healthy and strong. We be discover that we are able to endure, withstand, and overcome situations and circumstances would, that would have previously taken us out. So man, today I just want to encourage you. I want to charge you to stay hungry for the things of God. If you haven't started diving into the word of God, now would be a great time to start. Pastor Lisa has released an awesome devotional, a wake up devotional. Be sure, go right now, download it. And that's a great starting point to growing a hunger for the things of God. When we spend time with God, when we pray, when we read about God, that is when our identity in Him is revealed. That is when we find His purpose and His plans for us, right? We all have our own purposes and plans and goals that we desire, but the best plans are the plans of God. And how do we find it? How are we able to discern what is God and, and what is our own flesh and our own desire? It's by having a hunger and feeding on the things of God. 
Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So when we hunger and when we thirst for the things of God, it is going to fill us, not just spiritually, but we're going to see our lives come into alignment with His. And like we've been talking about in Proverbs 11:10, that when the righteous prosper, the city is going to rejoice. So when we are righteous and we are prospering in the spiritual, we're going to start to pr prosper in the physical, and then we're going to take that to the city, and the city is going to be enjoyed excuse me, the city is going to begin to rejoice. So stay hungry for the things of God. The second way that we can grow and, and have greater growth in our lives so we can produce a great harvest is if your heart is the soil, we need to pull the weeds often. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of of your life. When you're gardening, it's important to do routine maintenance. When you see weeds start sprouting, right, you want to start plucking the weeds out, right? We don't just cut the weeds at the top, but instead you have to pull the weed out by the root because if you don't pull it out by the root, it'll continue to grow and spread. And when it comes to our heart, we have to do the same thing. The best strategy is always prevent bad seeds from taking root in the first place, right? We don't want to get to the point where we start looking at the weeds in our life and be like, oh, that's just a small thing. I'm, I'm going to just leave that there. Or look at another weed and be like, oh, that's just a, a little thing. I'm going to leave that there. Or, or look at a rock in our life and be like, ah, oh, that's, that's not too bad. I'll just leave that there because then these weeds and these rocks, they'll begin to grow and, and, and take root in our lives. For, for example, if someone has offended you, and you're like, oh, that, that was just a little offense. I, I'm going to just brush that off. Sometimes it begins to, to take root in our lives. If it's left unresolved, it can become anger and, and sometimes offense, and it'll start to turn into weeds of bitterness, into weeds of resentment. However, when we resolve the issue with the person and we extend forgiveness, we prevent the seed from taking root and becoming a life-choking weed. Colossians 3, 5 says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. So we need to put to death. Sometimes we need to put some weed killer in our life. We have to go back and reflect. And even after we have received the goodness and we're starting to grow roots in our lives, the enemy is still going to try to come in and place weeds, place seeds in our life that is going to try to stop our faith from growing. So pull the weeds. Reflect, ask God. Say, God, where is a weed in my life that I need to pluck it out? Where is some, some, some weed roots in my life that are left undealt with? Where are some rocks in my life that are preventing me from growing deep within you so that we can pull these weeds, so that we can make our soil, our, our heart in a place where we can grow deep with God? And the last way that we can have greater growth, if your life is like a tree, the deeper the roots, the better the fruits. God wants us to grow deep roots, not shallow roots, but deep roots. So how do we grow deep roots? Where do we grow deep roots? That is by getting planted in the house. People will know how deep your roots go by the type of fruit you produce. In Matthew 7, it says, a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. A bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruits, so you can identify people by their actions. If your roots stay too close to the surface, they will be unable to get the nutrients and the water they need to grow the tree and, and produce these, this great harvest. It is only when the roots grow deep that the tree can find what it needs to not just survive, but 
to thrive. And it's not only when we allow our roots to go deep in the house that we can truly thrive and flourish into the people God has called us to be. God wants us to be a church. God wants us to be a people. God wants us to be saints in the city, saints in the house that are deeply rooted in Him. Colossians 2 says, let your roots go down into Him and let your lives be built on Him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth where you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. You will overflow with with thankfulness. Let me tell you something and encourage you, maybe chair one, a new believer, even a growing Christian in, in chair two, deep roots don't grow overnight, right? We don't plant a seed and then go to bed and then boom, we wake up and bang, Jack and the Beanstalk, look at my mango tree. It's up, it is fully harvested, there's mangoes, I can pick and I can begin to eat. Wouldn't that be great if it was like that? But it's not. Deep roots take time. It takes commitment. It takes consistency. It takes faithfulness. It takes staying connected in the house and, 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 and nourishing the plant, nourishing the seed, providing the right amount of sunlight upon the seed so that it can continue to grow and grow to the point where it's ready to harvest. So if you're in chair one or chair two, Man, stay connected in the house. Be consistent. Make church a priority. Be faithful to God. Be faithful to the house and the fellow believers. There are redwood sequoia trees. And they're some of the tallest trees on earth. They can reach over 35 feet tall sometimes with 25 feet in diameter. And yet its root system can range from five feet up to 12 feet, which isn't very deep for trees. Some trees, they're, they have like really, really deep roots, but these redwood sequoia trees, they only go six to 12 feet deep. And, and as I was reading out about them, I was like, how can something up to 500 tons, over 35 feet, live for centuries and, and remain standing when, when heavy rains come, when, when, when storms come, when floods come. How are these trees still standing when their roots are still shallow? Well, as I was researching the redwood tree, the redwood tree root system, it's, it's a little different, but it's a great reflection of being connected and planted in the house because it said that these, these redwood Roots, they may not go deep, but they stretch. They extend up to 100 feet from the trunk. So that's pretty far. So they may not go down 100 feet, but they extend 100 feet. And then as they extend, these redwood trees often grow in, in, in thick groves. And so there's a bunch of redwood trees around and they're all extending and then they begin to intertwine with one another. And sometimes this intertwining actually causes that, these, these things to fuse together. And the trees grow very close and, and they end up becoming dependent on each other for nutrients. And they end up strengthening one another and help hold each other up. Though their roots may not be deep when they're intertwined and they're, and they're locked in and there's a ton of them around, then it ends up strengthening and, and providing support for one another. When the, when the winds blow and, 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 and the water comes, they hold each other up and they're, and they're sort of feeding one another through their root system that is intertwined. And it's a beautiful picture of the house of God because faith and life wasn't meant to be done alone. It was meant to be done in community koinonia, in fellowship, in, in, in community. And when we're planted in the house of God, not only will our roots grow deep in God, as we talked about early, but we'll begin to intertwine our lives 
with fellow believers. And, and this community, this, this, this tight-knit uh, uh, community will begin to, to strengthen us when, when, when one of our fellow believers is going through a hard time and, and it'll help lift us up when, when, we're, when we're struggling. It'll help us to, to, to pluck the weeds. Maybe they'll be able to see a weed in our life and, and sort of encourage us and be like, hey, I, I see a, a, a little weed in your life. Hey, l- let me help you pluck that. Let me help you get this rock out of your life and we'll be able to pour back into them and, and help and help revive them and, and, and encourage them. Why? Because our lives are intertwined. Jeremiah 17 says, they will be like tr- a tree planted by the waters that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought. It never fails to bear fruit. It never fails to bear fruit. When we are planted in the house, when we have gotten the weeds out of our lives, when we have plucked the rocks out of our, when we have guarded our hearts, when the enemy is swooping in trying to drop seeds, trying to drop weeds in our lives, but we're seeing it before it happens because we're, hungry for God's word because we're pressing in in prayer because we're worshiping him we're getting to know him and and, and view things the way that he views them when we begin to intertwine our lives and allow our roots to grow deep then God will produce a great harvest in your life not just 30 not just 60 but more than a hundred times greater than what was originally planted. So church, continue to grow. Continue to press in. Continue to water the seed of faith that God has planted in you. Whether it was five days ago, whether it was five years ago, whether it was 50 years ago, continue to grow because God's not done with you yet. He still has a great plan, a great purpose for you. He still has a great harvest he wants to bring into your life. And we simply have to continue to grow, continue to feed our faith, and continue to be planted in the house. For some of us today, maybe you're hearing about this for the first time. Maybe God is placing a seed in your life right now. And I've been talking about the different chairs and we've been talking about the different heart conditions, the hard heart, the heart with rocks in our heart that don't allow us to grow deep roots. Maybe it's the heart of of thorns and weeds that is sort of choking the faith out of us. And tonight God is planting a seed in your life. I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Because this holy week is the foundation of faith. On Good Friday, we celebrate and we reflect and we remember what Jesus has done for us. Because God, he sent his son, his one and only son down on this earth and his name was Jesus. He was fully man and fully God. And he sent him down here to die. Why? Why would he send his one son, his only son, down on this earth to die? Because he loved you so much. He didn't want to be separated from you for eternity. And the only way he could come into community with you, come into relationship with you, was if his son, the perfect sacrifice, would be made. And on Good Friday, Jesus was beaten. He he was... He was put on a cross and and killed for you so that by his blood, that by his stripes, you could be healed, that your sins could be washed clean so that when he planted a seed in your life and you said yes to him, that you would receive eternal life, that he could send his Holy Spirit down into your life to help lead you, to help guide you, and help you fulfill all that God has for you, that help you bring a great harvest in your life. So if that's you tonight, 
So if that's you today, I would love an opportunity to pray with you. All you have to do is click the hand in the chat, maybe, maybe put the hand up in the chat and say, Jesus, today I choose you. I was broken, I was hurt. There's holes and there's things in my life that I need to get rid of. And I know that the only way I can do that is by receiving you today. If that's you today, right now, put in the chat, I choose Jesus. I choose Jesus. And let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son to die for me. I am a sinner. But by his blood, my sins have been washed clean. So today, I receive the seed that you have planted in my heart. I choose you, Jesus. Bring your Holy Spirit into my life so that I can feed on the things of God, so that I can grow the Spirit within me, so that I can fulfill the plans and the purposes that you have for me so that I can be a saint in the city that will prosper for you, that I will bring my great harvest to those around me so that the city can rejoice. I love you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Congratulations, congratulations if you made that decision. Be sure to tune in for the rest of of this holy week. Continue to feed on the things of God because we have so much in store for you. And if you are on Oahu or in Manila, we would love for you to join us for our in-person services this upcoming Good Friday and Easter weekend. Again, check it out. We love you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Turn his face towards you and give you peace. Aloha.